On the bench today is a TRS-80 Model 1, only recently acquired from eBay. Unfortunately, it was not packed well for shipping and suffered some damage here and right here. I'll throw an insert here of a photo of the packing job that the shipper did. And uh, the monitor was sitting on top of the computer here, which caused this damage to the paint and gouge in the plastic there. I know from the eBay listing that it was partially working, probably just bad video RAM, but it's really dirty. I think it's been sitting in a dusty storage shed or garage for 30 years, and it really needs a cleaning. And for some reason it shipped with two power supplies. I'm not sure why. Maybe one of them is for an expansion unit that uh, wasn't included. So the first thing I'm going to do is clean it. And uh, to do that, I'm going to do a complete disassembly on it and just wash everything. Looks like the monitor was made in 1978. First thing I'm going to do is take the monitor apart and clean it up and see if I can't repair this crack right here. So these aren't screws in here. These are hex nuts, it seems. Have to get out the nut driver. And it just barely reaches. Wash this. Well, the dust level isn't too bad in here. No anode cap on the anode makes it easy to discharge. I haven't turned it on, so I didn't expect to charge on it. I want to do a complete disassembly, take the tube out, all this out. But unfortunately, it's not going to be as easy as I had hoped. The yoke doesn't have a disconnect, so I'm going to have to take the yoke off. And I won't be able to back this connector out through the hole, so I'm going to have to desolder the connector here at this board. That ground wire was connected right here. I think this grommet for this wire was glued here by someone at some point. I'm going to have to try to get that loose. I'm going to use acetone to glue this crack back together right here. And I reinforced it on the inside with another piece of plastic here to keep it from spreading again. Unfortunately, when I was cleaning this piece, I noticed this, which I didn't notice before I took it apart. Major crack right along the corner here, so I'm going to have to try and glue that back together with acetone as well. This actually isn't straight acetone. This is uh, plastic bottle cement. It's acetone and butyl acetate, but it's super thin and it gets capillary action will carry it into the cracks. Press it together for a while here. Well, after a thorough scrubbing in the sink, put the picture tube back in. The, uh, the crack here, I used just acetone on and a little bit of uh, additional plastic there to reinforce it. For this crack I just used acetone and then I followed it up with a bead of Gorilla Glue here. 
on the back side, as you can see a little bit of a few grains of missing plastic, but the uh, seam looks pretty good. It feels pretty sturdy. It seems that someone glued this grommet in place front and back and the wire won't move in there and I couldn't get it out without cutting things so I desoldered the pots from the wires and now I'll solder everything back together the signal cable and the adjustments. I'll have to uh, fine-tune this later after I get the computer turned on. This will uh, level the picture. I've had these uh, Exolite nut drivers for 25 or 30 years, I think, and uh, they smell just like vomit. Nice. So after some washing and a little 303, it looks much nicer. Next I work on the power supplies. I've cleaned this one already and to my surprise this one has screws on the bottom. I'm not used to seeing that in these. Usually you have to crack them open. This one I don't think has screws in the bottom. These are adhesive. This one still needs to be cleaned up. So I'll clean that one and then I'll check the voltages. There's something rattling around inside here. It might be the fuse. I need to open this up and it looks like it's like somebody's been trying to open it up already and uh, maybe they just replaced it with that one because they couldn't get it open but I'll make a somewhat of an attempt to open it Hear the glue cracking. Oh, making progress. Pieces of plastic floating around in there. There's the fuse. So this transformer screwed in from the top to here and that's come loose. It's not that big a deal. Maybe a little bit of epoxy in there. It does appear the fuse is open but it's also partially desoldered over here. So I have to replace that fuse and check the solder joints there. I can't seem to read the value on this thing but uh, if the information I looked up is correct it's a uh, 2 amp and I don't have any spare pigtail fuses right now so I'll have to order one. In the meantime let's take a look at this other one. This is a little precarious but if this is right it should be 15 to 17 volts AC and I'm getting 19 and a half but it's unloaded. And on <clears throat> pins 4 and 2 
should be 19 to 21 volt DC. Be careful not to short the adjacent pins. Let's see what we got on here. 19.5 volts DC. That's good. Maybe. Maybe it's welded together and this is just holding the transformer in and this is a huge mistake. Maybe it'll come apart. I can give it a visual inspection at least. Well, this one's much cleaner inside. This is probably the fuse. This is the AC input here. So this power supply has a date code of 1980. It looks like it's uh, it's okay. So the next step is to take a look at the computer. It desperately needs a cleaning. Uh, pull the keycaps, take it apart, visual inspection, etc. These screws feel like somebody's had them out before. In fact, this screw belongs in this hole. These screws in the front are a little bit shorter than the ones in the back. The ones on the side are somewhere in the middle. Back, front, back, front, side. Looks to be in pretty good condition. It's pretty rare actually for the port cover here to actually have the tabs on it still. These tabs on the inside here are not broken. So that's going to get a wash. It's a little bit dusty in there. Give these key switches a good visual inspection too. Sometimes they get bent out of shape. These notoriously have pretty bad key bounce. Wash all these keys in warm soapy water. So this is interesting. This has the level 2 basic mod, but I don't see the cassette mod installed, so this is going to be troublesome loading anything from tape. The spacers are intact and look okay. And they're stuck to the plastic, so I'm going to have to work these off before I can lift the board out. There we go, there's one. Spacers are sort of rubbery material and they, they've gotten sticky. Just got to pry them away from the plastic there. They should come off. There we go. Nineteen seventy eight copyright. 
probably came off the level two basic mod. That needs cleaning. Take a close look at all the switch contacts. Make sure none of them are bent out of shape before we put the keys back. Try to get all this dust out of here. One of the really annoying things about the Model 1 is that all the connectors on the back are the same. You can uh, end up plugging the video cable into pretty much any of the spots. It'll fit in the video connector, it'll fit in the power connector or the tape connector, which means you can end up plugging the power connector into any one of them. Power goes next to the power switch, then video, then tape. So, let's plug the power in here. If it go in. There we go. Plug the video in. Now let's see if there's any smoke when we turn it on. No smoke, a little bit of garbage, maybe video RAM, I have to do some checking. So even though the screen is all kind of screwed up, if we type blind here, 10, print, hello. Go to 10, run. So it looks like it's executing programs. Basic is working. If I press break, we stop the program. I think we're just looking at video RAM. There are seven video RAM chips, and I only have four spares. So hopefully it's only one or two of them that are bad. I could probably do some math and figure out which one it is, but I think I'm just going to get out the desoldering tool and socket all of them. The RAM chips are all socketed over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But if memory serves, video RAM is over here and it's not socketed. So I'm going to have to uh, dig into the schematics a little bit and take a look. I've identified the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven video RAM chips here. And now I just need to, I've marked them here in the corner, but I need to mark them on the bottom side of the board. From here, it's the one, two, three, fourth chip. Two, three, four. So it should be right below this hole. Yep. And then the three just below that. One, two, three just barely got this uh, long board in the way
It's always hard fighting against gravity like this, but with this keyboard connector on there, I can't really flip the board around. One chip down, six to go. Just a little bit of solder wick to get the last few minutes of solder on the other side of the board. Might be loose now. There it is. After socketing everything, let's check and see if the picture looks the same. Pretty much the same. So I'm going to try swapping out these, well, hopefully good chips. These are replacement chips that I ordered, but uh, remains to be seen if they're any good. Pretty much no difference. The original one back. Try the next one. That's a bit different. Better. Still not there. Well, I hope we don't have more than four bad ships. Much better. But there's still a problem down here. Let's try this last chip. I don't have a replacement for it, but I'm going to put this other one in there. Yeah, no, that one's definitely bad. Oh, 
I'm not exactly sure that all of these are bad. So let's see. That one definitely looks bad. We do have four bad chips. Maybe even five. If we assume that all the remaining chips are good, then it won't matter if we swap them around. That's what I'm going to try now. These end up as at symbols. And you see we've got a problem here. Take this suspected bad one, move it down one more. Pretty similar problem. So I'm starting to think we do have five bad video RAM chips. Okay, so turns out I've got five bad video RAM chips for some reason, and I only had four on hand, so I had to order some more. And uh, while we wait for those to come in, I'm going to check the voltages here. I'm on the top side of this large power resistor to check the 12 volts. Let's see where we're at. That's pretty good, 11.99 volts. I'm not even going to touch the adjustment. Turn it off, and uh, we're going to check the 5 volts. At the left side of R4, R4 is over here, and we should have 5 volts here. Let's see. Seeing 4.889. Adjust R5, which is right here. And we'll recheck the 12 volts after making that adjustment. Still 11.99. 5.006. Enter the voltage at the anode of CR2. CR2 is over here somewhere. Right there. So here at the anode of CR2 we have negative 5.1 volts. Plus or minus 5% we're in tolerance. 5 volts. 12 volts. Voltages are good. And while I wait for some chips to come in, I'll turn my attention to the tape drive, get this cleaned up, and see how well it works, if it needs any work. Some corrosion on the battery contacts, of course. Looks like only on the negative side.
belt still intact. Feels like fabric reinforced. Need some cleaning regardless, but I'm going to check it out here and see if it works. The spindles are not turning, but I hear a motor going. Black wire broke off here, not surprising with the corrosion. The red wire go. We get this cleaned up. We've got a lot of wires attached here. Well, the auto stop was clacking every time you press play because this little lever here was jammed down. So that'll trigger the auto stop and it was stuck down there and even now it's sticky. I have to get cleaned up. The belts are intact but they're still loose. They need to be replaced because they just don't have the torque to drive things. They're slipping. Well, it's a few days later. And I got the parts in that I ordered, some belts, and some chips. So I'm going to install the belts here, put the tape recorder back together, and then get back to the computer. So uh, as far as sizes go, the main drive belt I measured at 11 inches and secondary belt at 8 inches and the counter, tape counter belt at 4.2. Let's hope I got it right. So this belt needs to go on first and then I can put the... Uh... Did I put the screw back in there? Something's holding, there we go.
the old belts on here weren't really disintegrated, so there's no real belt residue, but I'm just going to give them a quick cursory cleaning. There we go. Get it over here around that one. And then over here around this one. And put the screws back in. There's a little bit of tension there, but it is pretty loose. There's a little extra thickness on this pulley that'll add to it, and I'm hoping that's enough. Might have been uh, better to go with a, a 7.8 inches. Put the cat stand back on. Use the hook here to pull this up and over the pulley there. It's uh, it's pretty loose, but uh, better loose than too loose than too tight. I think it's going to be okay, uh, but a 7.9 or 7.8 probably would have been better. Yeah, it's helpful to record yourself doing the disassembly and you can review the video to see what parts came from where. That looks good. Get the counter belt on.
No sound. Should at least be getting loud static. Well, as it turns out, it is sort of partially working. The audio cuts out very quickly, though. And when I left off the uh, TOS-80, I believe this video RAM chip right here was still bad. We had four spares and five bad ones. I got myself a tube of replacements here. So, uh, pop another one in there and see if that solves the problem. See if that solved the problem. And there we go. No more noise on the picture there. Key bounce. So I didn't realize this before, but it turns out that this TRS-80 is only 4K. I checked the, uh, the RAM chips and they're only 4K chips. So there's going to be a limit to what software I can run on here. One of the things that I still need to do is open the monitor back up and adjust the, uh, the yoke. When I put the monitor back together, I just eyeballed it and uh, it's close, but it's off a little bit. There may be a few other adjustments I can do in there. So I'm going to do that now and tighten down the yoke so it doesn't move anymore. In the manual, there's this little type-in program you can use to adjust the screen. So I'm going to try typing that in now, deal with the key bounce. Fast forward through this so you guys don't have to watch me type it all in. I think there's a mistake in this uh, listing. The printout says set to 127 comma X, but this for loop, this loop is for Y, so I'm going to change that to a Y and see if the error goes away. Yeah. So if you're using this program, there's a bug right there. The uh, set command should be using the variable on the for, lo for loop there. Create the box and I'll adjust the yoke and then there's a couple of adjustments here on the side and we just reset. <laughs> I gotta type it all in over again. Just have to adjust the yoke to level. So while I'm looking at the screen there, I'm gonna torque it a little bit till it looks level. Pretty good. 
and tighten this screw down a little bit more. That looks pretty level. There's a bit of an artifact up here, which is something to do with the CRT. Picture's a little bit unstable too. But I wanted to uh, take a look at these adjustments right here. This is a horizontal centering adjustment and a vertical centering adjustment. And we just reset again. Picked up some 2 amp pigtail fuses, so I want to revisit this older power supply with the blown fuse, see if this will fix it. This has had some, uh, some heat damage and this trace is loose here. It's lifted from the pad. It's, yeah. There's nothing on the bottom side, so um, it doesn't make sense to solder it down to this. I'm just going to solder it straight to the wires. Pretty dangerous here, it might short circuit again and blow the fuse. 19 volts AC. Spec says 15 to 17 volts AC, but it's not loaded right now. Ground is it's ground and 19 volts DC are right next to each other. So I'm going to turn the power off. Turn the power on. Check the voltage. 18 volts DC. So that fixed it. I don't want to glue this because I might have to take it apart again. There we go. I'm putting the case back together and I just realized the sticker says 16K level 2, but the model number 26-1004 is the 4K level 2. So either that was a mistakenly applied sticker or a mix of parts. Getting back to the tape recorder, I decided to uh, give the tape a play in another machine here. that in the places where I was playing it on this machine it drops out so I think the problem over here is with the record switch I wasn't getting any audio because the erase head was being engaged I think there's a problem with the record switch inside this is the record switch right here pushes in and it's engaged by this, uh, this little leaf spring here which is connected to the record key pushes in on the switch to change it from playback mode to record mode and I don't think it was stuck in 
but there might be a problem with the contacts. So I'm going to spray some uh, deoxid in there, work that back and forth a little bit, and be a little bit more careful when I put it back together. Now, let's see if that did the trick. It's possible I'm going to end up erasing this, but let's see. Nope, oh, looks like that fixed it. I noticed that the counter wasn't working, so I had to take it apart again. Turns out the reset button was catching on the case and not coming up all the way. Sounds like it's working pretty good now. Let's see if it'll record. Testing, testing, one, two, three, this is a test. Testing, testing, one, two, three, this is a test. So let's see if we can save and load from the tape. See, save. Let's record and play ahead of time. The remote wires in so the motor's not running. And the motor's running. That was pretty fast. Now it's a small program. I have the volume control set to 5. Hopefully we'll see some kind of a loading indicator here in the corner. Yep. Well, it loaded just as fast. That yeah, works pretty good. And I went through the process of typing in that little test program again. And saving it. So that works. Now that I look at it, I think the screen is still a little bit crooked. I might have to go back in and readjust that yoke. I use some 303 on the black plastic, which always makes the blacks look a lot better. Unfortunately, I can't do much about the damage to the paint here and the ding in the plastic. In any case, it certainly looks and works a whole lot better than it did when I got it. Not much left to do on it, maybe a few minor issues here and there, but I'll go ahead and end the video now so I can get this out in time for the end of Septandy. Thanks for watching.